Hi, and thank you for joining me for another video. And friends, today I want to talk to you about a very, very, very important topic. And friends, the topic is, or rather this lecture is on how Messianic Jews who keep Torah and Halakha are from a halachic and even hashkaftic perspective full Jews and should be treated as such within the Orthodox Jewish community. Um, now, that may not be as shocking to hear than this, that this even applies if they believe that the Creator, the God of Israel, has a body or has clothed himself in a body, or even believe that the God of Israel might possibly be made up of parts or sectors making up one unit, no matter what these units may be called. So, today, my friends, I've decided to put my personal philosophical opinions aside and really try to explain this issue from within a Jewish theological and halachic perspective and framework. And, friends, I honestly believe that any other rabbi out there who really carefully, honestly analyzes this issue would arrive at the same conclusion. And, friends, I would really appreciate if people would not misconstrue this lecture for what it is not. In other words, this is not an endorsement for Christianity, neither its beliefs or practices. No, friends, I'm just giving my rabbinic opinion on what I believe is a serious, serious issue. Because, actually, certainly, again, my friends, certainly, in my personal philosophical opinion, or according to my personal philosophical opinion, I find any theological argument, either Christian or Jewish, about some supposed corporeality of the Creator, or a Messiah that already came and is coming again, or even the supposed compound unity of the Creator of Israel, to be both foolish and idiotic. But again, this is just from a philosophical perspective, and not halakhic. However, my or anyone else's philosophical beliefs should not and cannot seal a person's or a group's religious status or fate if what they believe does not literally contradict what is called Judaism. And what is that? What is called Judaism? Friends, Judaism is not what you or I decide it is. In other words, what Judaism is was decided long ago on Har Sinai, and neither my or your opinion can change that. In other words, Judaism is Torah and Halacha, and nothing more. Torah are the mitzvot within the five books, within the Chumash, and Halacha, or the Halachot, are the practical decisions and or interpretations made by the Beit Din Agadol, the Sanhedrin, which, I might add, are also literally endorsed by Torah itself. Which is why I'm making this video to state that according to Jewish law, in other words, Torah, what we call Judaism, According to this, Messianic Jews halakhically are not heretics. Again, if they keep Torah and Halakha, which would also include undergoing a halakhic conversion if they are not already Jewish. In other words, if the only thing keeping them from modern-day normative Judaism are beliefs about corporeality of the God of Israel and possibly splitting him into parts that make up one, they are to be considered full Jews and not be discriminated against according to Halakha. And friends, if you have a personal issue with this, apart from the silence shown about it by Chazal, you should have to explain why do you then consider many other rabbis of the past and even present that hold similar beliefs still Jewish? Because, friends, the truth is that we're actually fighting about nothing. We're really fighting about nothing. And this is not really just my opinion. This is what Judaism has to say about it. And what's that? What does Judaism actually have to say? Well, honestly, from a halachic pre rishonic perspective, nothing, because it's silent on the issue. And again, friends, I know that this may come as a shock to many of you, but please, please do not take this last statement of mine to mean that I endorse the Messianic movement in any way, because I do not. But rather, I just have to be honest to Torah and Halacha and not fabricate or peddle any claims that a group of Jews are not Jews when they are from a Torah and Halachic perspective, okay? And friends, I'm not saying this from the perspective of once an ethnic or genetic Jew, always a Jew, because those of you who've seen my lectures in the past know that I teach against this concept. But rather, that as Torah Jews, we have a halachic framework we must work by. And according to that framework, these individuals, Messianic Jews, are not technically classified as Ovdei Avodazara or Kofrim. Though, I again, adamantly, philosophically disagree with their beliefs. And the shocking truth is that many modern rabbis know this to be true, but what they stay silent, mainly because of the silent war that Jews have waged against Messianics. So, friends, let me try to explain a little further. Look, I know many 
in this lecture, we'll just ignore that I said that this is according to Jewish law, and we'll just say that Rabbi Asher Mason has become a Christian. But no, that even though I'm anticipating stupid responses and the ultimate backlash I will receive from the Orthodox world, friends, I still feel that as a true towards you, my first obligation is to truth, and that I must remain theologically and intellectually honest if I'm going to be any use to you as a rabbi. Which is the main reason I know you tune into my lectures to begin with, because ethics, truth, and accuracy have always been my agenda, no matter whose toes I happen to step on to achieve that outcome. I know that apart from incorrectly classifying messianics as heretics in previous lectures, I have only brought to you pure Judaism. And as you know, I'm always willing to publicly debate anyone who says anything different. And friends, honestly, I believe that the biggest confusion in properly understanding this issue is ultimately knowing how Judaism functions. And this point is really the basis of my whole thesis. Because you must know, friends, that Judaism has a pre-existing systematic framework to itself that decides how it functions. Now, mind you, I understand that depending on what community you hail from, your Judaism may differ from the other guys. But ultimately, if all the static Torah and halakhic decisions are upheld by your group, and your cultural additions do not contradict the latter, there is no reason for you or your group to be hailed as outsiders within the Jewish religion or people. Which is ultimately how I now view Torah and Halacha keeping Messianic Jews as belonging to a community of their own while still upholding the prerequisites that make them socially and halachically Jewish, i.e. keeping Torah and Halacha. And if they are to be unjustly excluded for their obscure beliefs, are you willing to also exclude other accepted Jewish groups or rabbis for their beliefs. So again, friends, a big question you should have in mind is ultimately, what is Judaism? And friends, Judaism, again, is not what you or your rabbi want it to be or whatever society would deem it to be. No, my friends, like we said, ultimately, Judaism is only Torah and Halakha and nothing more. And as you know, that there are also an untold number of works and opinions surrounding these, but these works or opinions do not and cannot change or alter Torah or the actual Halakha, which is what I'm basing my conclusions off in this video, that according to, again, Torah and Halakha, an, <clears throat> an individual can believe that the Messiah came and is coming again, and that the Messiah is the God of Israel incarnate, and still be a 100% kosher Jew. And again, these are ideas that I deeply philosophically disagree with. But again, this is a disagreement that does not depart from the philosophical and is not literally opposed to Torah and Halakha. Now friends, the big question is when did the notion begin that a Jew who believes in such messianic doctrines loses his Jewishness? And the short answer is the Rambam, both in his Mishnah Torah and according to his 13 principles of faith. Now, many would then say, oh, well, there you go, the Rambam. That's Judaism, so case closed. Well, friends, not exactly. What may also sound a bit shocking for you to hear and ultimately embrace is the fact that the Rambam was only given his personal opinion on the issue. An opinion that, if you remembered how Judaism's theological framework functions, has no ultimate significant bearing on someone's religious existence as a Torah Jew. Now, again, I also personally agree with the Rambam's philosophical argument behind his assessment. However, I do not agree with him in labeling such individuals as heretics, which could then be tied into how these individuals are to be later treated, which from a halakhic sense could even include possible death, right? Again, when this was not mentioned by Chazal, which is the parameters that the Mishnah Torah was forced to work from, and friends, please know that these aren't just the words of Rabbi Asher Meza, but rather this was also an area that many, many rabbis attacked the Rambam on for his attempt to close the book on the issue not ruled upon again by the court. Not to mention that there existed many, many rabbis at his time and before and even after that believed that God himself had a body. And that many even believed that he was made up of parts which according to many rabbinic historians included many of the Tosafists, or many of the rabbis from France. Which is why we see the Ravid make his famous attack on the Rambam, saying that how could you declare someone who believes that God has a body a heretic when greater rabbis than you, Moshe, 
also believed the same thing. Also, we also have records of the Ramban, Nachmanides, arguing with other rabbis on this very issue, on how he was also against the corporal notion. But the view was prevalent, my friends, at their time, and even today if you think about it. Because remember, the Ramban was only a Rishon and not a Tana or an Amara. Not that Tanaim or Amoraim could rule on a person's spiritual outcome, especially on an issue that was never really clarified in Torah, which is why they're virtually silent on the whole issue to begin with. In other words, aside from some derogatory references made about some magician named Yehoshua, nothing definitive is ever said about what he or his followers actually taught and believed and how it was forbidden. Why? Because the Talmud, my friends, was never preoccupied with belief to begin with, but only practice, which is why we find tons written about the Kutim, the Samaritans, and even some written about the Sedukim, why? Because they were individuals who differed in Torah slash rabbinic practice. And what they actually believed, no one really cared about. That's why it doesn't really mention it in the Talmud. Not to mention that there were opinions found even amongst Chazal that seemed to lend to the fact that some may have held similar beliefs regarding the Messiah possibly being divine or the Creator Himself possibly having a body. And even the Messiah possibly returning from the dead. Not to mention later Kabbalah's dissection of the Creator, Chas Shalom, through Partsufim and the all-famous Asmut. In other words, it seems that extra-biblical beliefs seem to bother us now more than it ever bothered the sages back then, or even many Mikubalim or Kabbalists today. And when I say extra-biblical beliefs, I mean that it is scripture and predominantly Torah that lays down belief, and even the source of all we practice before it is socially translated by the court. You know what? This is actually the same argument we make against the Christian world. Now, the argument resonates a little better with their source text, being that they claim to believe in solo scriptura. When we constantly tell them, how can a good God punish the Jewish people for not believing in a Messiah, not clearly referenced to in Scripture? While they then begin to judge us by the words of their New Testament that does not and cannot change or override the words or the lack of words found in Torah about that issue. Do you understand that if it is wrong for them to theologically judge us from a non-authoritative perspective or from non-authoritative text, how is it right for us to do so? Now, our job is a little more difficult because we also believe in an oral or rabbinic law that ended with the Sanhedrin, which, like I said, is mute on this issue. Because again, friends, anything that can be thought up in terms of belief that does not literally contradict a mitzvah or even a hashkafa found in Torah is in a religious Jewish sense, I'm sorry to say, fair game to believe in, no matter how foolish it may seem. Because, friends, it has always been only Torah that unites us, and that's all. So let's stop fighting with our Messianic brothers and move forward together. Because again, personal opinions or the opinions of later rabbis cannot be used to divide the Jewish world further in a definitive sense. For example, I give a lot of lectures explaining how philosophically many ideas espoused by many today may not be philosophically consistent with other more important Jewish ideas, but I try not to label someone not Jewish or not in the covenant unless that person is literally breaking and teaching others to break a mitzvah or a halakha. And I've given this courtesy for almost everyone in the Jewish world except messianics. And for all those listening, please consider this lecture a form of penance for what I may have said in the past. That being said, I believe the greatest problem facing us in the religious Jewish world is the ultimate failure of separating fact from opinion, which ultimately has us over on being Baal Tosef, right? Of adding to the commandments of the Torah, both written and oral. Which is what happens when you have Messianics or Kabbalists, or anyone for that fact, before teaching their doctrines and ideas, beginning their talks with Judaism teaches, right? Instead of saying, we think or it is our opinion. Giving the listener the opportunity to know that this is not necessarily the will of God being spoken, but instead only an interpretation of Torah and or Halakha, the only true building blocks of Judaism. So again, friends, you must first understand the systematic theological framework I'm using to make these claims, because I know that many are just going to start posting post-Talmudic sources showing me on how some rabbis called Christianity idolatrous. And friends... I'm familiar, but this does not in any way set a new halachic or hashkafic paradigm. In other words, it's just their opinion 
an opinion I happen to agree with, but ultimately not definitive Judaism. Now, I could give the reasons why I think early rabbis did not necessarily consider what Messianics believed to be a form of idolatry, or why did they fail to mention this altogether, but this would also just be my opinion. But I think that if anyone could just think of what's contained in Scripture, they would also find that there's enough contained there to confuse a less educated mind to stray from what is considered normative, in at least a Hashkafic sense. Now, Halakha, in the many ways that it can be understood, is a little less fluid than the sea of words we find across Tanakh that can lead to strange ideas. Now, we know that this wasn't an area that the Rambam himself was lenient on, regarding both Torah and Halakha keeping Jews. For example, he writes in Mornabuchim that, that you can keep and believe in what you're supposed to keep and believe in, and at the end of the day, still not have a share in the world to come if your beliefs are not properly understood. Which is where he makes his famous derogatory statements about Turks and other peoples that, in his opinion, mentally were not developed enough to become monotheists. An idea that I'm trying to defeat with this lecture. For example, Whenever you debate or discuss with a Christian, he or she does make an attempt to justify what he or she believes off of Scripture. Mainly from obscure passages in the prophets and even the writings, but friends, an attempt is made. In other words, he or she does not try to convince the Jew through astrology or other sources. He may use the sections in Scripture that refer to the anthropomorphic references to the Creator of him having a hand or a foot. References that logically are easy to disprove, but references that should not get one thrown out of the covenant just because someone chose to take it literally. Now, in regards to halakha, it could get you thrown out because the court's rulings on legal and practical issues are definitive. However, the modern-day interpretation of those issues or of those rulings are not, which is actually another video in itself. And again, friends, all I'm saying here is only regarding Christians or Messianics who adhere to halakha, i.e. the Sanhedrin's legal rulings and those who believe Judaism is not just traditional Christianity with a kippah. And friends, one reason why Christianity proverbially easily slips through the theological cracks than let's say other non-Jewish movements that may be mentioned historically or legally ruled on by the court is that ideally Christianity, or actually Messianic Judaism, is just Judaism gone philosophically wrong and not a whole foreign religious entity that seeks to undermine Torah. Now, ultimately undermine it may if we fail to eliminate it via logic and discussion, just like I feel with many other neo-Judaic mystical movements, but far, far from ever being considered a biblical or halachic form of idolatry. And friends, this goes for anything that may be excluded or not mentioned within Torah and Halacha. And know that Torah and Halacha does include almost anything you could think of in some way or the other, but there are things that it does exclude, which is why... Ethically, at least in the last two centuries, it has been hard for the Jewish world not to see the average evangelical Christian as anything else than a moral ally to virtually all principles laid down in Torah. Now, I know that this could not be said with Christian Jewish persecution before, like that of the pogrom of the Catholics, the Orthodox Church, and even early Protestants, and this video is not in any way condoning their theological differences, which clearly does not include rabbinic interpretation of scripture and the keeping of halakha, and which is idolatrous for us. Rather, again, I'm only discussing the Torah messianic Jew who keeps all the prerequisites, but just harbors belief or teaches the corporeality of the God of Israel and splits his unity into segments. Friends, I think that by continuing to push this anti-Messianic agenda, especially now that Messianics know the truth, this only makes us look cruel and ultimately hateful, not just to them, but to anyone from the outside looking in. Especially that now, I've even heard rabbis beginning to use the same terminology they, the Christians, have used against us for thousands of years. Words like, if a Jew believes in the Messianic doctrine, they will be condemned for eternity. Or if one of your past relatives were messianic, they are being tormented as we speak. So ultimately, friends, how does it benefit us in hating the average Christian or messianic a whole lot over ultimately a whole little? Not to mention that, not to mention the countless divorces and ultimately broken homes that our baseless hatred has caused by having those returning or converting to Judaism divorce their messianic or Christian spouses instead of telling them 
that if the spouse would just accept Torah and keep halacha and convert, they could stay with their messianic ideas. Because as you know, no one nowadays would ever convert a spouse who held messianic beliefs, even if it was to keep a family together. When, again, there is no halacha telling them not to. But you know what? I certainly would. Or you have individuals who solely solidify their Jewishness only on the fact that they're not Christian or Messianic. Instead of some altruistic urge to repair this world via Torah with other ethically like-minded individuals. And friends, it's really time to put away all the nonsense that ultimately keeps us separated as Torah believers. Because Torah, my friends, has always been what unites us as Jews. And along with Torah, what it sanctions, i.e. the rulings of the great court, what is known as Halakha. And friends, this is how I conclude. That by what we know from Torah and even Chazal, Jewish Christians who adhere to Torah and Halakha are to be accepted as full Jews. For more information on everything Jewish, please visit TorahJudaism.org. Thank you.